Amen. Thank you guys for uh, coming and joining us. Uh, today, uh, we, we're starting a series, and uh, the series uh, has something to do with talking about the center piece, okay? But it's talking about Jesus and the cross. Jesus, the power of the cross. The power of Jesus' cross. There's power in Jesus' cross, and, and he's the centerpiece. He's the centerpiece of every single thing, and it, and it reminds me of, like, basketball or football, right? Uh, if you play basketball or football, no matter what, you have to have a ball in order for it to be a legit game. Actually, if the ball is removed, you don't have a game. If you remove a, the basketball, you don't have a game. You know, it's over. Uh, the basketball determines everything, right? It determines where you release the ball, determines how many points you get, you know, whether it's a three-pointer, whether it's a two-pointer. Um, you know, the basketball is everything, how you dribble it, um, you know, if you dribble it or not, you know, you'll get traveling char uh, uh, penalty. Football, same thing. If it crosses the plane, it's actually, a, 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 you know, a touchdown. If it goes through the goal post, it's a field goal. If it crosses a certain uh, yard line, it's a first down, and no matter what, you can talk about football, you can be excited about football, but these small things, a football or basketball, it makes a big difference in the game. Matter of fact, it's the centerpiece. Without it, you don't have a game. Now, many people are actually, um, they got multi-billion dollar uh, organizations, you know, now, NBA. NFL, right? They have multi-organizations. Uh, these organizations go are streamed, and, and you see them all over the world. And you have multi-millionaires, multi-billionaires that own them. And it's people gather together in coliseums and in stadiums, and people each actually argue over these teams. There are some people, uh, I won't say, there are some obnoxious fans that are out there. I won't name any teams, but they're out there. And they'll argue for about that team, right? But let's be honest, if you don't have a basketball, there's no game. If you don't have any foot, if you don't have a football, that small ball carries so much weight. Where people are being paid multi-million dollars for a small ball, um, it's, I'm reminded when I think about Christianity, I'm reminded of the cross. It's the main thing. It is the main thing in Christianity, just like the football in, in the NFL or in a football game, just like the basketball in the NBA. It is the main thing. Christianity there is no Christianity without the cross of Jesus Christ. There's no Christianity without that centerpiece. What Jesus gained at the cross is the main thing. Without the crucifixion of Christ, there is no power. There is no strength. There is no victory. There is no forgiveness. There is no authority. There is no freedom. The cross is the main Thing. And often in uh, Easter, uh, we'll celebrate, you know, the Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. And we'll talk about, um, you know, resurrection and we'll, we'll talk about a lot of things. Uh, and then it seems like we forget the other 51 Sundays often. And, you know, this, I mean, it's like just like someone forgetting the football or the basketball when playing football or basketball. You, you got to have the ball. It, it decides everything. If we gather at the right place with the right people at the right time, but we don't have the right focus, what it equates to is an empty shell, which is what we call it religion, an empty set of rules, regulations, requirements, to try to legislate spirituality, and it, which will equate to no intimacy, no grace, no power, which is defeat. Often we're trying to live the Christian life without the main thing, without Jesus and what he did at the cross. The, the cross is the greatest affirmation 
and demonstration of God's pure love. That's where we see God's pure love. Ourselves, our families, our communities, our churches. Today, we're not lacking knowledge or life skills. Often what we're lacking is pure love an experience of, of God's love. And, and we have to remember the cross. Remembering the cross of Jesus is very important. Remembering the cross of Jesus is very important. If we forget the cross of Christ in our Christian walk at any time, what we're doing is we're finding ourselves in a religious rut. And we'll find ourselves just living a shell of a life with no intimacy, no power. We'll be trying to Upkeep all these regulations, these rules, these requirements. Don't do this. Don't do that. You can do this. You can do that. Forgive. And you'll be trying to do all that, and we'll try to do all that with no power because it's not connected to the cross of Christ. We'll be trying to accomplish these things, and we have to remember the cross. And, and Paul actually wrote a letter to a group of individuals, to some individuals that have accepted Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. They had started a church, and it was in Galatia. And in the book of Galatians, in your Bible, Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, in this writing to the, the audience of Galatia, the apostle Paul urges them over and over again to remember the cross. He tells them, stop forgetting the cross. Galatians 6 verse 11 says, notice what large letters I use. He's, he's writing them in bold letters. Like if you were texting someone and you put bold letters, this is extremely important. Matter of fact, some people would say you're shouting it. You're screaming at them. If you text and you double tap and you have caps all the way across, he says, notice what large letters I'm using to write these closing words. And I'm, you know, in my own handwriting, he said, this is important because often Paul would dictate. Meaning Paul would, would, he would speak what he wanted to write and someone would write it and they would send the letter. But he says, this is how important this is. I'm writing it with my own hand. I'm not dictating. I'm not, I'm not having someone else do this for me. It's so important. I'm old and I barely can write. But guess what? I'm putting bold caps on this one because this is important. This is very important what I'm about to tell you. Verse 12, he continues, he says, those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. Now, circumcision was an old religious law and a ritual and a rule and a requirement before Jesus Christ came to die on the cross. Before Jesus Christ came to die on the cross, oh, they would have to be crucial. They would have to have their, they would have to have a circumcision at a certain time in their life. They have to cut off the foreskin when they were young to prove that they are Jews. They're God's people, which was really a picture of the crucifixion of Christ, crucifixion of your flesh, the cutting away of your flesh, the cutting away of your old nature, the cutting away of your old behaviors. But it was a picture. It's like if my wife went out of town and she went out of town, and, and I hadn't seen her in a while, and I'd start looking through my pictures, and I'd look in my photos, and I'd look at my wife, and I, I would kiss her, and, and, I, and I'm like, man, mm, I can't wait till you get back, Elena. It's like I would do that every single day, every day, every day. I would kiss the picture, and I'm man, I can't wait to see my wife. I'd FaceTime her, talk to her, and hey, babe, how you doing? Oh, my God, I can't wait till you get here. Then one day she calls and she says, hey, I'm coming back, babe. I'm like, yes. She's at the airport. She's at Love Field. I jump in the car. I drive in my car, and I get to Love Field. And as soon as I get to Love Field, I pull out my phone, and I FaceTime her and start kissing the pictures on her phone. That would be crazy, right, because I got the real thing right in my face. That's what they were doing when they were crucif when they were, when they were circumcised, and it was a picture of Jesus being crucified. So he's saying, why would you still be circumcised when you got the real thing right here, right now? Amen. Jesus died already. You don't have to do that anymore. Amen. And so he continues, says, they don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. He says, they don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. They don't want to do that because they're going to have problems with people. 
Because when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's persecution. People were being beaten. People were actually being, uh, you know, stoned. People were being incarcerated. People were catching flack because they were preaching that Jesus Christ alone is the only one way to save. Jesus Christ alone, his death on the cross was the only way you could get right with God. They, he, he, they were, so they were doing away with all the religion. And the religious folks were getting upset, so they would actually go beat the people that would preach this. Because they were like, man, you're messing it up for us. We, we have all this control. We're telling everybody what to do. It happens like that even today. Today, some people get frustrated when you tell people that it's a free gift to salvation. People get frustrated because they want you to rule and regulate people by telling them what to do and, and controlling their life. He says, no, if you just put your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross, right now you can be saved. Some people don't want you to say that. And look what he continues to say in verse 13. And even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. So Paul is saying even those people that are telling you to keep these rules, they can't keep the rules themselves. Have you ever had somebody do that? They always tell you what you should do and what you need to be doing, but they themselves, they can't keep the rules themselves. Religious folk, you know what I'm talking about. Folks are always telling you what you need to do. Come on now. But then they, don't, they can't find themselves doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so it's that even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. I mean, they can't do it all. They only want you to be circumcised so that they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. So it's all pointed to self. Verse 14 says, as for me, may I never boast about anything else except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. He says, in the in the cross is where my interest is at. My interest for the world have been crucified. I don't even want that stuff anymore. He said, and the world's interest in me has also died. He says, because I've put my faith in Jesus, I don't have to try not to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to go get drunk. I don't want to go get high. I don't want to cuss nobody out. Why? Because that interest, that desire was crucified when Jesus died. See, religion tells you try to stop on the outside. The, the power of the cross is he stops you from having a desire on the inside, from even wanting to do that. And so Paul had been saved quite some time ago. It had been a long time since he had been saved. But he was still saying, I'll only brag on the cross. I'll only brag on the cross. In verse 15 it says, it doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. He says, stop pushing the religious agenda. He says, it don't matter if you've been circumcised. What matters is, are you a new creation? Have you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Have you put your faith in Jesus and the cross? Paul's only point of reference for his life was the cross. The cross was central to his very existence. It was the power to overcome his weaknesses. It was his identity. It was his hope. Anyone that really truly have had an encounter with Jesus and what he did at the cross, you know that's your only hope. You know that's the only reason why you exist. You know that's why you're here today, right now. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jesus and what he did at the cross. Because there's a big difference between religion and relationship. And we all got to make that choice whether we're going to have religion or relationship. So important for us to get this. The reason Paul spent so much effort focusing on the cross in his letter to the Galatians was because they had become confused about what true spirituality and power meant. They become confused. They didn't understand where the power came from. They forgot. They thought the power was in their works. They thought the power was in their traditions. They thought the power was going to church. They thought the power was in prayer. And there is power in prayer, but it's, it's not the prayer itself. It's the faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross. It, it, you can pray all day and have no faith and nothing changes. You can go to church all day and read your Bible all day. And without faith, nothing happens. And so they were confused. 
They were putting their trust in religion. They were putting their trust in the, the rituals, the rules. They were no longer looking to Jesus and his death on the cross and, and the sending of his Holy Spirit for his power. They forgot that the power was in Jesus and his death and the sending of the Holy Spirit. They were looking to what they could do and not what Christ already did. See, often that's what happens in Christianity. We begin to start thinking about what we're supposed to do instead of focusing on what Jesus already did for us. And, and when that happens, what happens is we begin to get an empty shell. And so in Galatia, in that religion had gotten in the way of the cross. Religion, not the relationship. Religion had gotten in the way of the cross. Verse 12 says it clear. It says those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. Look what it says. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone saves. He says, you know what? We would rather teach you and preach to you about religion instead of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would rather teach you the how-tos. This is how you heal your marriage. This is how instead of the crucifixion, you got to die to self. This is, this is how you overcome the temptation. No, no, no. Just put your faith in Jesus Christ that he actually took that temptation away already when he died on the cross. You can go back to the cross and all that. And often what happens is we begin to start busying ourselves and getting caught up in the works. Instead of our walk, we focus on our work for God instead of our walk with God. Paul was saying that this was keeping them from experiencing the fullness of Christ. Have you ever felt like that? That somewhere it's just like, I don't know if y'all have ever seen this movie called The Last Dragon. It's a very old movie. Old movie. Classic. But there was this time, what would happen is this man, he, he would play they, they played karate or kung fu, and they, they would fight. And they would call themselves getting the glow. And when they got the glow, like, oh, you could just fight real good, right? And then this guy, and, and so there's this one guy called Show Nuff. <laughs> and he put his hands out, and it starts static. Like, they, it, wasn't, it wasn't, his power was just like, like, it was either not depleting, but it wasn't effective like, you know, the other guy. The other guy, he had a glow on him, right? And, you know, but the other one, it was like it was static, like something was missing. Have you ever felt like that in your Christian walk? Where something, like it was something like you, there's a disconnect. Like I don't have the power that I was supposed to have. Like something's missing. Like I don't have that glow like I was supposed to. And, and Paul was saying, you know what's keeping you from experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ and living the abundant life is religion. Let me explain what I mean by when I say religion. Religion is an external commitment and involvement with no relational experience with God. It's an external commitment. I'll serve. I'll get involved with no relational experience with God. Like you want to do all these things, but nothing on the inside. No, no connection. No, no you know, intimacy on the inside. One of the greatest dangers in America and in churches today is for religion to replace intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Where we want to do, I don't know how many times I've talked to people and we've had discussions and they say, hey, man, you know what, I just want uh, to you know, get back on track. And, and they equate getting back on track with serving God. And I start, in my mind, I'm, you know, I got like one of those mental, I'm scratching my head, right? Like in, in my mind, I'm scratching. I'm like, there's no way that serving gets you back on track with God. Serving God is different than loving God. Big difference. That's why they call loving God, serving God. <laughs> that's, why it's two, that's why it's two statements. And, and so what religion does is it calls you to make a, a commitment, external commitment, and involvement with no intimate experience with God. Like there's no real true quiet time with God. Haven't heard from God. You know, God haven't said anything. Gave you clear directions. 
which he will do if we seek him, if we pray to him, if we talk to him, if we put our faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross. Whenever religious activity trumps intimate relationship, the power of Jesus Christ is no longer experienced in the believer's life. So you got a shell of a woman or a man of God. They just, they, you know, everything is go- being done on the outside, but inside there's nothing. No convictions, no word, no, no word of wisdom, no direction. God has not spoken. And, and what gets us in that condition is we, when we focus on external commitments and involvement instead of internal intimacy. And we're no longer experiencing the fullness of Christ. We're kind of like just hanging around. And and religion is anything you do for God that does not stem out of a heartfelt connection to God. Religion is anything you do for God that does not stem out of a heartfelt connection to God. Like, it's, it's just doing things just because you want to stay busy or you want to get involved. And God wants us to have intimacy with him. God wants us to have a connection with him, a true connection. I heard of a college guy who he had to do a research research paper uh, for his professor. And so he began to start getting prepared, you know, um, the student began to start doing his due diligence, collecting uh, all his data, collecting the material, analyzing the possible, uh, you know, arguments that he would, pro- would propose. And, and the student felt real good about his research. The student actually turned in his research paper to his professor, and um, he, he was really excited about what grade he would get. So he finally got his paper back, and he had a big, fat zero on it. And he had a little, little note. He said, Great job. The student was a little confused. He said, great preparation. He's like, what? But wrong assignment. It wasn't that the work wasn't good. It was the wrong assignment. And God has given Christians excitement. He's given us all assignments. And so Christianity is no different. A lot of great work. Helping people. Having the correct words. Just miss the cross of Christ. You speak a good Christianese, amen, praise God. God is good, ain't he? Never late, always on time. Start posting all the good quotes and stuff. Start posting all the scriptures, all the good things. Just wrong assignment. God said, I never asked for all that. Matter of fact, he, I've told you, you can say, Lord, Lord, but don't obey me. And I've told you that you can preach, teach, and cast out demons in my name, but I'll still say, away with me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I told you what the assignment was. The assignment was to get to know me. And that's done through Jesus and what he did at the cross. That's the power of the cross. That's the power of the wrong assignment. The reason external rules, regulations, and requirements can get in the way of relationship is because it becomes a legalism. Legalism is, it measures your spirituality by your activity. So you start thinking the more you're doing, the more you're spiritual. Like the more you do, the more spiritual you are. Legalism is, it's always do more, be better, go further, pray longer, strive harder. It's always do, 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 do. Instead of what Jesus done, 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 done. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free. I like that. Because it gives us the impression that you can get set free by Jesus Christ, accept him as your Lord and Savior, and then you can go back to bondage. Well, how, Scripture explains, and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. There it is. He says you can begin to start getting religious and start trying to get caught up in the rules and regulations. He saying you can get caught up back in the bondage and you won't be free. 
because you're not putting your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross. So Christ has truly set us free. Like sometimes it's hard for us to process that. We entangle ourselves within the bondage of our emotions, of our feelings, what we think. It's hard to process that I'm, li- I'm really free. I remember when I first got saved, I really didn't think I was free. You could tell me I was free. I could read it in the Word, and God would tell me, hey, you're free, but I would still live in bondage. I would still cuss people out and fight and argue and, and, and live in unforgiveness. Why? Because some weird reason in my mind, I was going back to that bondage. I was going back to the very thing that Christ has set me free from. And so it says, listen, verse 2, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. There's the, there's the word behind what I said earlier. I said that if what happens in our Christian walk is our Christian walk become null and void because of religion. We don't experience Christ in our life because we have religion Religious activities trumping our relationship. This is the scripture that says, verse verse 2 tells us, it says, if you're counting on circumcision, if you're counting on religion to make you right with God. See, in those days they were saying circumcision, but in these days it would say, you know what, if you're counting on serving God to actually make you right with God. If you're, if you're expecting the baptism make you right with God, if you're expecting tithing to make you right with God, if you're expecting to serve, you know, uh, uh, kids to make you right with God, that's not going to make you right with God. The only thing that's going to make you right with God is your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross. He said, that's what makes you right. He says, you know what? Christ will be of no benefit for you. It says you won't get the benefits. What are the benefits? The freedom. That's what he's talking about in verse 1, right? Verse 1, he says, Christ set you what? Free. He says, so don't go back to bondage. So in context, he's talking about freedom. He says, Christ won't benefit you and have you free from your desires, free from your anger, free from your bitterness, free from your lust, free from your pride, free from your jealousy, free from all these things that you're entertaining. He said, you won't be free. Christ won't give you that benefit if you entangle yourself in religion. We got to fall in love with Jesus, not religion. Verse 4 says it like this. Verse 4 says, for if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, he's, he's doubling down. Like he's continuously making it clear. If you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law. Remember what keeping the law is. Keeping the law is is doing all the rules, checking off all the boxes, making sure you've done your devotion. Check. I prayed. Check. I worshiped. Check. I listened to a Christian podcast. Check. And all those are right if it's done with, from intimacy. But if it's done from external involvement or, or, or trying to, you know, make sure that your behavior on the outside is done right. It has to come from a place of intimacy. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. What what does this look like? It means your your intimacy with Christ, it's not there. He says, you've been cut off, not necessarily like going to hell, because remember, he's talking to believers, he's talking to Christians, so he's not saying you're going to hell. He said, you've been cut off, meaning your intimacy has been cut off. Like, you know, you don't have that connection anymore. You, you're, not, you're not hearing God the way you need to. You know how, have you ever been in a, in a, in a, in a weird place in your Christian walk and it seemed like, like, you know, you're not connecting like you used to? Anybody ever been like that? Yeah, like you, you're not connecting. You can go into worship and, and everybody else, you know, crying and you looking over like, what's wrong with them? It ain't that serious up in here. You know what I mean? Like, you know, somebody else will read the scripture and they just like, oh, my God, it's so good. And you're like, man, it didn't. It didn't do that for me. Well, something's going on like with your, your sensitivity with the Lord. Are you, you understand what I'm saying? Like your sensitivity to the Lord is not is, is where theirs are at. It's not that they're bad people. It's just sometimes we can be cut off because we're focusing on external behaviors and external involvements and external 
you know, activities instead of an internal intimacy. We got to fall in love with Jesus, not religion. We got to fall in love with Jesus, not religion. Well, how do we do that? Remember, we were talking about Jesus and what he did at the cross, right? Remember? Talking about Jesus and him dying on the cross, right? Jesus' crucifixion, right? But really, we need to have two crucifixions. And let me explain. Paul describes two crucifixions when he says it in verse 14. He talks about two crucifixions. He doesn't just talk about Christ alone. Verse 14, it says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's one crucifixion. Okay? Talking about two. And then he says, because of that cross, my interests in this world have been crucified. Oh, there's another one. He says, because of Jesus Christ." Cru- crucifixion. Now I've been crucified. My interests have been crucified. My desires have been crucified. My sinful nature have been crucified. The thing that caused me to want to go do those evil things have been crucified. So he talks about two crucifixions. He talks about Jesus being crucified, but he also talks about the believer once he accepts Jesus Christ by faith being crucified as well. He says, as for me, may I never boast about anything else but the cross, except the cross of Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, because of that cross, my interests in this world have been crucified. And the world's interests in me also have died. Like, I mean, I don't even have that desire in me no more. I don't even want that no more. Some people be battling, and this is what religion does. Because of a lack of intimacy, because of a lack of connection, because of a lack of of relationship with Jesus, what happens is we find ourselves trying hard not to do the things that we used to do. Because we're trying instead of Christ just crucified him. When we put our faith, when there's an intimacy, we know that Christ already crucified those desires. Because you're dead. A, a dead person, if someone was an alcoholic and they were dead, they were alcoholic, you know, in their former life, they died and they were in a casket. You can put a bottle of gin in there, Ciroc or whatever you want to put in there. And they are never going to wake up and get that bottle open. Why would they never do that? Because they're what? Okay. What he's, Paul saying is, when Jesus died, what? I died. He says, as for me, many... May I never boast about anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, see, he's taking it back to where we're supposed to put our focus. He's taking it back. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to people about people getting saved. He's talking to people that's already saved. He says, because of that cross, verse 14, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. My interests in this world have been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. On the cross, Paul was crucified to all the things belonging to this world. Everything that belonged to this world, it was no interest of him no more. Being crucified with Christ means, one, being disconnected from the world, two, being aligned with Jesus now. You see, so being crucified to Christ means, one, I'm disconnected from the world. I'm I'm not plugged into that no more. I don't even want that anymore. Two, now I'm in line with what Jesus wants. I'm in step and in tune with what Jesus wants. I'm doing it. I'm I'm not perfect, but I'm in line with what Jesus wants now. I'm disconnected. That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. He says, I'm disconnected from the world. What does it mean, world? World, organized system that lives separate from Jesus. That's what it's talking about. When it's talking about the world, it's talking about Not God so loved the world, God so loved the people, that's what he mean in that. But he's saying, I'm disconnected from the world because the world that I'm talking about right now, Paul was talking about, do not love the world nor the things of the world. He's saying this organized system that lives separate from God. This world that totally contradicts God. This world that don't want nothing to do with God. The world doesn't mind religion. You can talk religious in the world all you want to, but it despises an authentic relationship with Jesus. The world despises an authentic relationship with Jesus. But you can have religion all day. 
You can have religion all day. The cross is not about religion, though. It's an expression of a love and the payment for all mankind's sins in the past, the present, and the future. So now you don't have to live with the guilt of the past. You don't have to live with the pressure of today, and you don't have to worry about have the anxiety for tomorrow. You don't have to worry. You, that's where anxi anxiety and all that worry is it's about the future. Pressure is usually about today, what's happening now. And then guilt usually has something to do with the past. And so you know what? Jesus already paid for every single thing that happened in your past, your present, and your future. That's something good to, to think about. God is already. I'm going to go ahead and close this up right here. If you fail to make the cross the central focus of your life, the centerpiece, if you fail to make Jesus the centerpiece of your life, you will never truly find out who you really are. You will never truly have an identity. What you, what you will run is you'll run the risk of experiencing extreme disconnect in various areas of your life. You'll feel extremely disconnected because of a lack of connectivity with God. You always feel alienated. You always feel awkward in spaces. You, you, it would always take place because of the simple fact you fail to get your identity from Jesus himself. You'll always feel awkward. You, you'll feel, feel extremely disconnected. In a world now where we're all so connected through phones and internet and social media, we have a way of being connected like the world has never been connected before, and people still feel isolated, feel alone, feel depressed, feel alienated. It's so many people still that, that you know, they, they can be in a, a room full of people but still feel alone. Why? Because they have not identified with Jesus who they really were created to be. I remember I always, before Christ, I always had internal battles about how people felt about me, what they thought about me, what they were saying about me. I was always paranoid. You know, and there was another extreme where I don't care, but obviously if I'm thinking about it, I do care. And I could be in a, a room full of people, but I felt so disconnected, like people didn't understand me. And I can even feel that way today at times if I don't, Make that reconnection to the Lord and get plug in with God and make sure, because I know he's the one that gives me identity. He's the one that gives me security. I know I like swimming sometimes, and often a lot of people like swimming, but it's how far do you want to go? Do you want to go deep? you want to go like scuba diving or something? And that's the same question I have for people in life. How far do you want to go? How deep do you want to go? Because if you're going to go deep, like 100 feet beneath the surface of the sea, you're going to need some equipment. Because if you don't have any equipment, in about two minutes, you're going to die. You can't live under 100 feet up under the sea. And that's the same thing in life. I always ask people, how far you want to go? I'm going to tell you, you're going to need some equipment if you want to go deep. And that equipment is Jesus and what he did at the cross. You're going to need some equipment in order to go deep, to really go deep in your identity, to really find out who you really are. You're going to need, to, you're going to need some equipment in order to really have a point of reference for what really life is about. The cross is your equipment. It's your oxygen tank. It's your identity. It's your point of reference. It's your life. But so many people struggle in life because the cross of the Christ it's not the centerpiece. It's not the centerpiece of my marriage. So I'm chasing, going around, trying to find all kind of counseling in different places. Nothing wrong with counseling. But I'm going to tell you, we're going to need a centerpiece. Spiritually, we're going to need a centerpiece. We're going to need Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. Many of us, we don't know what to do with our kids. We're, you know, we don't know how to parent them. Or, you know, and the solution is right there in the word of God. The centerpiece, Jesus and what he did at the cross. 
Today is a day that if you have never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if you're online or if you're here, or maybe you have accepted Jesus and you put your faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross, but maybe you're like the Galatian church, just a little disconnected. You've been focusing on external activities instead of internal intimacy. Maybe that's you. But today I want to pray for everyone that may feel like they have not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Or maybe they have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they've just been focused on the wrong thing. Maybe you turn in the wrong assignment. Maybe you turn in an assignment and the professor, the teacher, the great teacher, Jesus saying, nah, that's, that's not even what I was testing you on. I was testing you on intimacy. I wasn't testing you on works. I was testing you on a relationship, not on religion. Maybe that's you, but I want to pray with you today. I want to pray and ask you, you know, to repeat a simple prayer that I believe that will bless your life. That can reset everything on the inside and begin, cause you to begin to walk on a path on the outside to be effective and powerful because of what Jesus is doing in your heart. Today, I want you to repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize today that I want a relationship, not religion. Today, I turn from myself and I turn to you, Jesus. I believe that you're the son of God that died on the cross for all my sins. Today, I ask you to come into my heart. I want to rededicate my life to you. I want to give you the innermost being in my heart, my desires, my interests. Lord, work inside of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for everyone here. I'm praying that Jesus, the you and what you did on the cross for us, will become the centerpiece of our households, will become the centerpiece of our marriages, of our families, of this church. I pray that what you did on Calvary, Jesus, we won't be able to shake it. We will always be reminded of what you've done for us, that we're nothing without you. We'll never be able to overcome anything worth having without you. We won't be able to overcome things, our temptations, our burdens. We need you, Jesus. We need to constantly have our focus on what you did on the cross. You tell us in your word that when you're lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you. And we're praying, Jesus, that you're glorified in this place that you're exalted in this place, that you're lifted up in this place. And Lord, I'm praying today for a fresh revival, a reset in our hearts to be focused on you, Jesus, and that beautiful work you've done for us on Calvary. You loved us, and you love us like no one will ever love us. I thank you. And I give you glory and honor and praise. Bless these people here. Bless their household. Bless their finances. Bless their fellowship. Bless them. For real, oh God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. As we lift up our hands and we lift up our hearts. Bless them for real, Jesus. Stop! to get closer to you to get to know you to hear you thank you Jesus